is a virus that can pick up a gene in one cell and carry it to another cell. Well, these RNA tumor viruses have picked up a gene, incorporated a, a chicken gene into the virus genome, and they use that chicken gene to alter the cell that they invade. And so they cause that cell to go into uncontrolled growth. That is, they cause the cell to bypass the checkpoint. We've already talked about checkpoints in the cell cycle. And so these genes that bypass the checkpoint are the first glimpse that science had into what the genes are that, when mutant, cause cancer. So even though the single-stranded RNA tumor viruses aren't a major cause of human cancer, what we have learned from them from model organisms like the chicken gave us our first look at human genes that cause cancer because it's the exact same <coughs> set of genes that are used by these viruses in chickens that are mutated, invariably mutated in humans when cancer arises. So these genes fall into a very nice group, five categories in what is called the signal transduction pathway. So remember what's happened. We have G1 and S, and we have a major checkpoint there. The signal transduction pathway is how information gets into the cell to say, OK, go ahead and move from G1 to S. Remember, the requirements are a certain amount of growth in G1 and no DNA damage. So what we're going to look at now is how a cell <coughs> responds to growth factors. So what starts the signal transduction pathway is when a master gland sends out a signal that says grow. The signal is a hormone, but it's not like estrogen and progesterone. Estrogen and progesterones are a different family of hormone. These are steroid-based hormones. They're made by enzymes. Growth factors are proteins. So a protein is encoded by a gene. So what we are going to look at is a cell with a nucleus, chromosomes, and genes, and how information from some gland is sending out a signal this signal is going to go through the entire organism. Every cell in the body is going to see the signal. The signals, however, are very specific, with names like nerve growth factor, epidermal growth factor. So the growth factor is specific for one cell type, a nerve cell or a skin cell. And that specificity means that the receiving cell has to code for a receptor that sits on the cell surface and receives the signal. I'm going to fill in the details. I'm just going to give you the big picture first. So a gland located far away floods the entire organism with a growth factor that bumps into most of the cells in the body and has no receptors 
until it finds its cell. We're going to look at the skin, the epidermal cells. That's going to be the model that we're going to use to see how a signal sent from some gland is ultimately transferred into the nucleus to turn on genes to start replication and start cell division. So that's the big picture. What we're going to look at is a set of proteins here and then a set of genes there. All of these genes were originally discovered in transducing RNA tumor viruses. So that's the big picture. The viruses don't mean anything to what we're doing except that they showed us these genes way back in the 70s, maybe 60s, for the very first time. Oh, and by the way, because this stuff was originally done in Japan, a lot of the names I'm going to put up on the board don't mean anything in English. They're transliterations of Japanese words, which mean something. And so when I put strange things up, don't worry about it. Uh, it's just their names have stuck forever. So any questions on what we're going to do? This is going to be how cancer starts. So we're going to look at classes of genes. The first class of genes we're going to look at, that we've already looked at, are DNA repair. Remember, we did that earlier, probably Monday. Yeah, probably Monday. <laughs> DNA repair genes, when mutant, are called mutator genes. So we're going to see different classes of genes. That's the first set of genes. Typically, you're not going to get cancer <coughs> unless you have some way to make a lot of mutations. So in every system that's been looked at, the earliest stage that you can see a cell becoming abnormal, they have mutant DNA repair genes. <coughs> what we're going to look at now in this second set of genes are oncogenes. It's a very special class. The oncogenes code for the proteins that make up the signal transduction pathway. It's a very simple five-step pathway. Genes, each set of genes codes for a set of proteins. Any questions so far? Yes? Can you repeat what you said about oncogenes? So the oncogenes are the second class of genes, DNA repair first, the second class of genes that when mutant cause cancer. That's the definition of an oncogene, when mutant causes cancer. Which protein is it? Was that the on what protein? The oncogenes are a group of genes that when mutant cause cancer. We're going to go through the genes in just a second. In each category of gene, each category of protein. Anybody else before we start? So as I said, the first one, the first category of genes are genes that code for growth factors. specific example that we're going to use is EGF, epidermal growth factor. So epidermal growth factor G is in all the cells of your body. It's only expressed in one specific gland. It codes for a protein, a growth factor, 
that protein circulates to all the cells, and when it bumps into a growth factor receptor, <coughs> that growth factor binds to the receptor in a lock and key mechanism. So the epidermal growth factor protein will not bind to a nerve growth factor receptor. There are dozens and dozens of different flavors of growth factors. Each one has its own very specific growth factor receptor. So number two is growth factor receptor. EGFR. Remember, the whole idea <coughs> is to get information, information from this gland that says we need some more skin cells into the nucleus. This hormone, this growth factor, will not go into the cell. It will not go into the cell. That's what the transduction pathway is all about, is how the signal that it's there ultimately gets transmitted into here. Any questions so far? So growth factor binds to receptor. Now, on the inside, on the surface of the cell, attached to the membrane. And I've got this little, little bar from this circle embedded in the membrane. Is a protein called RAS. R-A-S. That's step number three. As I said, some of these names do not translate into English words, and so this is the first one. RAS is a G protein. G stands for GTP. You know what GTP is? It's the rival's sugar of the DGTP, actually the one you had on the exam. So RAS bound to the membrane is bound to GDP. The diphosphate is inactive. So this is inactive RAS. I think I've been using the circle for all of these systems where we go from an active configuration, from an inactive configuration, to an active configuration. And that's what we're doing here. What we have to do is activate RAS. So when growth factor binds to the receptor, the receptor sends a signal to RAS, and RAS converted to the active form and GDP is removed and replaced by GTP. It's not phosphorylated, it is exchanged. So the RAS is the key pivot point, we now have information in the cell. The pure binding of the growth factor, which changes this from inactive to active, now says there's something in the cell. This signal is now inside the cell. All we have to do next is get it into the nucleus. 
I can never answer questions that are why. It's just because. It's the way the mechanism works. I don't, I don't have a rational answer. It's an exchange mechanism. It's not a possible relation. Yes? It's the same. It's the same RAS, right? So it's RAS either inactive or RAS active. It's the same. I'm sorry. No, the growth factor makes the receptor active. The receptor then makes RAS active. So it is definitely. And so there's a lot of detail that I'm not going through. And so information is passed from the gland to the receptor. The receptor then says, ah, I've got a growth factor there, and causes RAS to become active. The pathway is well known. If anybody wants to hear the details, just stop by my office. I'll be glad to talk about it. It's way more detail than I want to do in here, way more detail than you want to use on the next exam. Think of it that way. Any questions? We're over halfway through the signal transduction pathway. We now have the information in the cell that the cell should start getting ready. OK. Next up is a protein called RAF, R-A-F. Like I said, these are Japanese transliterations. RAF is a protein kinase. You know what a protein kinase is. CDK is a protein kinase. The protein kinase is an enzyme that phosphorylates, that adds a phosphate to another protein. And so your cell, each, all of your cells literally run on protein kinases and phosphatases, which take the phosphate off. That's what dictates virtually everything, all the metabolism in your cells, runs off of a huge number of protein kinases. And so this is just another protein kinase. So we have inactive RAS, inactive RAF. Now, is activated because it is attracted to rat to RAS and activated on the membrane. So now we have an active protein kinase. I said there's only five steps. So we're almost there to get ready for the last step to send that information into the nucleus to tell the nucleus that there's a growth factor out there and get ready to enter into S phase for cell division. Yeah. <clears throat> so it activated because there's active RAS, or did it do something to it? This is the most complex step in the signal transduction pathway. RAS does not do anything to it in the sense that you take a hammer and, hammer and nail. RAS is only acting as a beacon to bring it to the membrane where it gets worked on. I can tell you in my office, but I won't tell you here exactly what's going on. It's pretty complicated. Literally, it took 20 years to figure it out. And just within the last three or four years is the pathway now pretty much complete. So all we're concerned about is that active RAS in the GTP form can activate RAF, but it doesn't do anything to it. And so all I've done is change the structure of the protein. That's what this represents, going from a round ball to a square. The protein changes structure. Structure function means everything in biochemistry. You change the structure of an enzyme, you can switch from active to inactive. Is that 
down to the inside of the cell wall. Which one? RAS, I guess. RAS is actually bound, so there's a, a uh, steel-like extension on one of the amino acids that is inserted into the membrane. RAS is attached to the inside of the membrane. Absolutely. And the growth factor has a domain that goes all the way through the membrane. Anybody else? So the fifth step we now have a gene regulator kinase ramp takes an inactive transcription factor, a gene regulator, and one example is a gene called MYC, and activates it by phosphorylating this protein. That's what that P is on the outside. And now we have an active transcription factor. Mick is one of a handful. There are a few others that are all going to be activated, not just one, just one example. Go into the nucleus and now start turning on the genes to get ready for DNA synthesis. So we're going to make the genes for the DNA polymerases, the helicases, and all the accessory proteins that we talked about. We talked about bacteria, but the eukaryote ones are similar, a bit more complicated. And so all those genes now have to be turned on and make the proteins to start DNA synthesis, replication. That's it. So what we've done is taken that growth factor and through a series of five steps information that the growth factor is there is transmitted into the nucleus to go from G1 to S. It's actually a fairly simple, straightforward pathway. Anybody have any questions? Yes? What is the P is it that's sticking off the Phosphate. What is what? TF. Transcription factor, gene regulator. Yes? What does GDP do? What does GDP do? It's just a cofactor that controls the shape of the protein. So it's just like any other small molecule, depending on which small molecule binds, the protein will take on different configurations. And so when the GDP is bound, the configuration is inactive. It cannot attract graft protein binds. When you, when you take off the GDP and put on GTP, it changes the structure of the RAS protein and now allows mix bind to it. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, so this is the pathway that tells the cell to go into it. This is the normal pathway that your cells are using all the time. Your stem cells are getting this information, deciding when to start making a few replacement cells, uh, skin, epithelia, so blood the, uh, cells. Regulation. Yeah, absolutely. So, so the glands have to, have to somehow get that information that we need more cells. And again, this is just one example. So there are lots of other examples for how this occurs. Yes? So what does the NMC stand for? It stands for MYC. 
Uh, so again, it's a Japanese word. I have no clue what the word is or what the word means in Japanese. Nick is a protocol. So all five of these, growth factor, growth factor receptor, RAS, RAS transcription factor, those are proteins. They're, the gene name is the same. So the RAF gene codes for the RAF protein. So that's the way the terminology works. For all of these, the gene and the protein have the same name. Any questions? This is the standard pathway that your tissues are using right now used it more when you were a baby, an embryo, growing, but still using it when you have to replace epithelial cells, blood cells, that kind of thing. Yes? So whatever there's a mutation in those autogenes for these, that's what leads to cancer. And so that's what we're going to talk about next. So this is the normal wild type. You need this situation. You need this. So if you, if you lose any of these genes, homozygous mutant, you're dead. And so these genes are absolutely essential. So now we have to ask, so how does a mutation in this pathway cause cancer? So that's the next question. We're going to take RAS as the easiest example. We saw a RAS mutant, one base pair changes one amino acid. So this is an oncogenic mutation. One nucleotide, very, very simple. I forget whether it's a transition or transversion. One nucleotide change changes one amino acid in the RAS protein. And that one amino acid now means that RAS oncogene, as opposed to RAS wild type, now binds GTP automatically. So the normal RAS, the wild type RAS, binds GDP, and it has to be worked on by an enzyme to exchange the GDP for GTP. But a single amino acid substitution means that the oncogenic RAS now automatically binds GTP. So <clears throat> what's happening is, since it's already bound to GTP, all that stuff already from steps three and five are already happening all the time then? Happening all the time. Did everybody hear that? Why don't you say that loud? That's exactly <clears throat> right. So, so since RAS is already bound, steps three through five are always on. So let's play a little game. one copy of RAS from your mother, one copy from your father. You cannot inherit the oncogenic RAS. You, 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 the, the embryo would just die. There's, there's no way. So this has to happen as a mutation in an individual. You cannot inherit an oncogenic mutation. For all five of those categories, it is absolutely <laughs> impossible. So it has to be RAS wild type inherited, RAS wild type inherited there. Now, in order for cancer 
to be possible. So it's not automatic. We'll talk about that as we get into this more. In one of your cells, there has to be a mutation to make that an oncogenic gene. One nucleotide which causes one amino acid change. So the genotype here is wild type over oncogene heterozygote. Now, the phenotype, we have wild type or we have cancer. So I'm going to let you puzzle that out. Look at the top board, the bottom board. Think about your answer. Is the phenotype wild type or mutant in the heterozygote? Think about it for a minute or so, and then we'll vote. We haven't voted for a while. <coughs> coming up, everybody has to vote. In this room, there are no abstentions. This is a dictatorship. <laughs> Think about, is that cell phenotype, wild type, or oncogenic? You said it kills it automatically if it's a baby and it has it. Everybody ready to vote? You need more time? All right. All in favor of wild type or the phenotype, raise your hand. All in favor of oncogene, raise your hand. Okay, there were enough of both. Find someone who disagrees with you and talk about it. See who's more persuasive. No discussion until this is over. Um. this diploid that's heterozygous and the wild type doing that, right? Mm -hmm. That's what the wild type does. But that is making that all the time. See, if it's making that all the time, 
without a growth factor signal, that <coughs> is going to signal to there, to there, to there. So, oncogene is the phenotype. Since it's a heterozygote, which one is dominant? Which allele is dominant? Which, re which allele is recessive? Okay, so oncogene is a dominant mutation. And we call this type of mutation a dominant gain of function. Because exactly what you're looking at, the mutation now has a new function. The new function of the mutation is to create a protein that automatically binds GTP instead of GDP. Everybody see that? So the mutation has created a protein with a brand new function. Could there ever be a dominant mutation that isn't a gain of function? There are dominant negatives. They're kind of unusual. It involves a different kind of protein, where proteins are interacting with each other. So yeah, dominant negatives would fall under that. So both are occurring, but because the wild type, or the, the oncogene already skips a step, they're, that one's just doing everything. Right, As, and so in, a, in an average cancer, probably 75% of, of just all cancers in general have a mutant RAS protein. It's one of the most common oncogene mutations in all cancers. It's a really small gene. You want to hand up? Yeah, so I know that we're talking about RAS in this mutation, but that'll hold true for any of the other Um. Well, it depends upon the function. Oh, it, it absolutely holds true for RAS. Yeah. It absolutely holds true for RAF. It okay. absolutely holds true for NIC. Um, growth factor, kind of, okay. but the uh, growth factor receptor, receptor kind of, not but not the growth factor. So the growth factor, the oncogenic mutations are, are, are really very different. Okay. Yes? Well, I assume there's a lot of them that we use one copy of our DNA and the other one. No, I never said that. No, 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 no. <laughs> Now, on the X chromosome, all you women obviously are doing that, but that's, a, that's an exception. No, no. When you have genes, other than a bar body, both copies are expressed. There are rare exceptions that I don't want to go into uh, where the maternal set is turned off in everybody's cell or the maternal is, or the paternal is turned off in everybody's cell. But those are really odd genes. 99.9% .9 of your genes, you're using both copies. Whether they're mutant or not, they're still going to be expressed. Unless the mutation knocks out the, the, the way to express the gene. Anybody else? Any questions on this? Let's look at one other one really quick. Again, Vaz wild type And now, just a knockout. So RAS minus means that we have killed the gene. And so lots of single amino acids can so disrupt the structure the gene can't function. But let's just say that we've eliminated the whole gene. We have knocked out the gene. It, it's not difficult to do. And a small deletion will, in fact, do that. And so that's one and two. We now have wild type over negative, and so again, what is the 
phenotype of this cell, look at the drawings on the board, and decide will this heterozygote, so well, these are two different heterozygotes involving the same gene, two different mutations, what's the phenotype of this heterozygote? Think about this for a minute or two, and then we'll vote again. No, do this by yourself. Anybody need more time? You want to vote now? How many vote wild type? Raise your hands. How many vote oncogene? Raise your hands. Okay. So this makes this RAS minus a loss of function recessive gene. And so what we have, the same gene, different nucleotide, different amino acid, the same gene can have a dominant mutation or a recessive mutation. We started off the semester way back, mentioned dominant mutations. I said they were very rare, and they are. And now you are seeing exactly at the molecular level what has to happen for a mutation to be dominant and override the wild type. Recessive is normally the rule. Most mutations that show up in the phenotype inactivate the protein and kill it, like this knockout mutation. So a single gene, because it has lots of amino acids, depending on which amino acid you change and how you change it, some mutations may be dominant, some mutations may be recessive. And so you're, you're getting an insight now into the molecular nature of how a change at the DNA level changes the phenotype. Totally different phenotypes from two different single nucleotide mutations. Any questions on this? So oncogenes are the second category of gene that cause mutation, that cause cancer. The third category, the third group of genes, are tumor suppressor genes. So this is all great, but remember, you have this checkpoint there. It's a really good checkpoint. That checkpoint will save your life. You cannot get cancer with a RAS oncogene mutation. I know we just went through it. That whole process will be just as I've outlined on the board. But that cell with a single oncogene mutation will not develop cancer. As long as all of your tumor suppressor genes are okay. The tumor suppressor genes are the genes that are managing this checkpoint. Now, the oncogenes are really nice because the overwhelming vast majority of them fit into just five categories. Can't do that with the tumor suppressor gene. There are all sorts of things, and everything we talked about, I think it was on Monday, all the things with contact inhibition, all that stuff, there are dozens if not hundreds of different genes that fall under the category of tumor suppressor. That is, they suppress cancer. As long as they're intact, that RAS is not going to cause cancer. It's potential but it won't happen 
unless we knock out the tumor suppressor genes. So to get cancer, you've got to have a whole list of mutants. That's what I said when we started this. Cancer is not a single gene mutation. Cancer is a collection, a multi-genic disease. And so the major checkpoint is a gene called RB, which stands for retinoblastoma. Again, retinoblastoma is a gene like RAS. It is probably mutant in half to three quarters of all cancers. It's that important. It is the guardian. It stands at the border of S phase and says, I don't care that you're mutant RAS. You are not getting in. Go away. Literally, it is, the, it is your guardian against a single mutant RAS oncogene. So retinoblastoma, retinoblastoma is a cancer of the retina in your eye, which is really unusual. And there is no explanation. This is a gene that is active and working in this, doing exactly what I have here in every single living cell in your body. Now, I've written it with a capital R, but the reality is that it's not a dominant gene. Remember, that was supposed to be the terminology. In animal cells, if we write the gene name with a capital letter, it says that the mutation is dominant. But people were fooled for a long time. Here's the story. All of a sudden, a child gets retinal cancer at the age of five, four or five, and he loses one eye. And then a year or two later, the other eye goes and he loses that, he or she. Even though the gene works in every single cell in the body, for reasons that nobody understands, the eye, the retina, is the one that has that happen. And so for you women, you know BRAC1. Everybody knows BRAC1. It's a universal gene. It's not a gene that's only expressed in breast tissue. It's a universal gene. And yet, when it's mutant, it causes primarily breast cancer. There is no explanation. The genes that we're talking about are universal, working in every single cell. And yet there's a whole long list of genes that even though they function identically in every single cell, they cause a very specific, primarily, type of cancer. And so retinoblastoma is one of those genes. It is the guardian of the cell cycle. You cannot get into the cell cycle with an intact retinoblastoma. So we're going to talk a little bit about retinoblastoma and a gene called P53. So we have five oncogenes that we talked about. We're just going to talk about two tumor suppressor genes. So retinoblastoma is the checkpoint protein. P53 is the damage sensor. P stands for protein. 53 stands for the molecular weight. It is 53,000. It's a protein of 53,000 molecular weight units because it was first picked up as a protein with unusual properties in cancer cells and just labeled P53, protein of this size, and then somebody figured out how important it was, but that name stuck. Yes? So wait a minute, you said that retinoblastoma is supposed to be the actual gene, the actual protein, I believe it is? That retinoblastoma is the checkpoint gene. Okay. That is the ultimate in a relay system that I'm going to describe to you, the okay. ultimate that has to give approval for entry into S phase. As long as RB is there, you're not going to go into S phase unless those conditions that you learned for the first exam, adequate growth and no DNA damage. So remember, in order to get cancer, you've got to have mutator genes. You've got to have lost 
the ability to repair all your genes properly. Now, P53 is all about DNA damage. It is not a sensor. It is simply a relay. We talked about DNA damage repair. So there are sensors. You have genes that code for sensors. You have a gene that codes for a protein that recognizes thymine dimers. You have genes that code for all kinds of proteins that recognize all sorts of mutant DNA bases. Anything not A, G, C, or T. As soon as that sensor recognizes, let's take thymine dimers. As soon as it recognizes thymine dimers, it binds to it as a beacon. The repair system comes in, has to alter the chromatin. And at the same time, it sends out a signal to P53 in the nucleus, hey, We've got damage. P53 then inhibits retinoblastoma. So that's the relay. P53 is getting information from the nucleus there's damage. So the nuclear sensors, it's a kinase relay, a relay of three or four protein kinases, where the major one phosphorylates a secondary, which phosphorylates a tertiary, which goes out in the nucleus and signals P53. Doesn't phosphorylate, I don't want to go into that. So as long as there is damage, P53 through another set of proteins, again, really complex. I'm just giving you the outline. P53 halts RB and doesn't let RB release the cell. Everybody see what's happening? So there are two possible outcomes. P53 is actually a gene regulator. So when this happens, one of the things that's going to occur is P53 is going to go into the nucleus itself and turn on DNA repair genes. And so P53 is going to start the process to speed up repair. But let's say you've been out and you really got sunburned. You've got a lot of thymine dimers. If the amount, so each thymine dimer is going to have a beacon going to have a relay sending information out. If the damage is too much, so P53 itself will either cause the cell to halt the cell cycle, so if the damage is light, not a lot of damage, we're just going to halt the cell cycle and let the repair system work and so G1 just gets longer. No big deal. As soon as all those sensors go away, phosphatases, the opposite of kinases, remove all those phosphate groups and P53 then lifts its embargo on RB. RB says go ahead and replicate. But if the damage is too great, if there's a huge amount of damage, P53 has an alternative pathway called apoptosis, which is programmed cell death. The operative word is death. If you have a really bad sunburn, you are going to lose some skin cells. They're going to die off. Uh, yes. Yeah. And so, as far as you're concerned, that's a far better alternative than allowing damaged cells 
to replicate. That's what this is all about. You've got billions of cells, and you have the ability in your stem cells to make new ones. It is way better to kill off a cell than to replicate a cell that has mutants in it that can then lead to cancer. After all, skin cancer from thymine dimers is at the second leading cause of cancer in Arizona, just behind smoking. And so this is a really critical process. And P53 is the protein that regulates whether the cell will commit suicide. It is committing suicide. Every cell in your body has a genetic subroutine, a genetic program. You have proteins sitting in your cell, ready to be activated at a moment's notice if P53 says it's time to call quits. And so that genetic program, or program cell death, is at a tipping point. All it takes is one little shove from P53, and that cell just commits suicide and gets replaced from stem cells. Yes? So P53 can either kill the cell through apoptosis or cause the cell to halt. Why does that say for CC? Cell cycles. Oh. Anybody else? Let's do another cell. P53 heterozygote, so you have lost P53 in one of your cells. Wild type or cancer are the two alternative choices. Think about this for a minute. What is the phenotype of a cell that is heterozygous for P53? Is it normal or is it cancer? And then we'll vote again. Get you in the mood for voting. <laughs> By yourself, do this by yourself. If need be, then we can have a discussion. Everybody ready to vote? How many vote wild type for a P53 heterozygote? Raise your hands. How many vote cancer for a P53 heterozygote? So find someone who disagrees with you and battle it out Raise your hands high. 
Nothing fancy about it. You can get by with lots and lots of genes that are heterozygous for a dead partner. As long as you have one good P53, it shouldn't matter at all to that cell. And so this is what we talked about on Monday, the familial part of cancer. If you inherit a mutant gene from a heterozygous parent, then if you grow up and all the cells in your body are heterozygous, then as soon as you have one mutation in that gene anywhere, that gene is now homozygous recessive and has lost its gate, its checkpoint. Um, so because there's uh, less p53, would it be more um, inclined to commit epitosis because nope, it's getting nope, more... Okay. No, nope. so that really doesn't... There's, there's a handful of genes that are actually... They're called dose-sensitive genes, where that's important. But the vast majority of your genes, you can get by. And that your heterozygous for <coughs> lots and lots, hundreds of mutants, we now know through, through sequencing. And so this is just an ordinary system. Unless... You have inherited one mutant copy. That's the BRAC1 story, the typical story for familial BRAC1. Every cell in your body has BRAC1 mutant. <coughs> you lose one BRAC, the second gene, and now you're homozygous mutant. Is there a difference in the uh, amount You're heterozygous. But heterozygotes are okay. Oh, it's heterozygous. Hemizygous means you only have one copy of the gene. I only have one copy of all my X-linked genes. But I have two copies of RAS, RAF, P53RB. Hemizygous means one gene. Yes? What if it was a wild type of mutant instead of negative? What if it was wild type and then you had like a mutant P53 instead of like, that, no, oh. That's what we just did. Same thing? Okay. Yeah, there's, there's no problem with that. So number four is telomeres. Telomeres is ordinarily required for a cell that's growing rapidly, a cell that's growing. People thought that was going to be the magic bullet for cancer. You just knock out telomeres and you stop cancer. 
But telomerase is not the only way to lengthen the telomere. So while telomerase is always activated in a cancer cell, it is not the magic pathway. There is an alternative pathway. As I said, you can't get cancer from a single oncogene. You might get cancer if you knock out in the DNA repair genes. These are recessive mutations. So you have to knock out both copies. Oncogenes are dominant. Tumor suppressor genes are recessive. A typical cancer cell literally has hundreds and hundreds of mutations because it's lost DNA repair. But what you see is typically two or three oncogene mutations. Two to three tumor suppressor mutations. And so in the cancer pathway, what you typically see in a cancer cell, and now because DNA sequencing is so inexpensive, hundreds and thousands of tumors have now been analyzed. There are thousands of mutations because of the loss of DNA repair. But typically, in the cancer pathway, you only see a half a dozen to a dozen mutations that really matter. And that's the problem with analysis of tumors, because there's a thousand mutations because of loss of DNA repair. You have to go through and ask for each mutation, does this matter? Does it give a small boost to cancer or not? And so that's taking a lot of time. Any last questions on signal transduction and how genes cause cancer? So lots of different genes cause cancer in lots of different ways. Yes? Why can, um, like, res minus B, um, like, why can that be passed on? The res, One day or no. um, because the gain of function can't be passed on, it'll kill the embryo. Loss of function, as long as there's a bad one, there's no problem. I was like, oh, like, we're thinking about that. We're like, should we grab the forehead? And I'm like, yeah. Mm -hmm. I was like, that needs to be a point. Yeah, it's really good.